podcasting from Chico, California, tucked in between some of Northern California's best freshwater fisheries. This is the Barbless Podcast, a podcast about NorCal fly fishing, guiding, fisheries management, and sustainability. If you have ideas or any questions for the show, leave the guys a voice message on the Barbless Podcast hotline, area code 530-636-2523. Also check out http colon slash slash podcast.barbless.co, where you can download past episodes and show notes. Be sure to follow them on Instagram at barbless.co and connect with them on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash barbless.co. Here's your hosts, Chad Alderson and Nick Hanna. Fish on. Hey, welcome everybody to another episode of the Barbless Podcast. I'm your host, Nick Hanna. Hey, Nick. NorCal, NorCal Fly Guy. <laughs> at NorCal Fly Guy. <laughs> it's funny when I'm out on the river, people don't even say my name. They're just like, hey, NorCal Fly Guy. How's it going? Yeah, famous. <laughs> oh, man. Um, what's up, man? Have you been, uh, you been out fishing? Uh, yeah, I did the North Fork of the Feather. Nice. And, you know, I watched my wife lose a couple super nice fish. Sweet. Um, but we made some adjustments, and we're going to go back out there tomorrow. I was um, lucky enough to go fish the close section of the feather downtown. Wait, with, how did you do that? With a couple uh, legally biologists. Oh, well, <laughs> no, yeah, legally with um, spears and stuff. Oh, well, we had the yellow vests and everything. It was fun, man. I, I've never tagged steelhead before, and um, I, I think the the most steelhead they've tagged in one day was was twenty one. So let's back up for a second. You got you got invited to go out there and tag steelhead then. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay, and the most that they had ever tagged in a session was how many? 21. How many did you get that day? 37. Oh, you got lucky then, I guess. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> it was crazy, man. There's so many fish uh, in that in that section of river. It's it's going to be wild. If it, if you get anybody listening and planning on hitting it up on the first, just be careful. There's a lot of spawning reds or you know reds out there and salmon making their net their beds and you know just tromping around in those that gravels can potentially can potentially ruin some, and then maybe wear some football in our future, football so. pads and helmet yeah it's gonna be there's gonna shoulder be a lot shoulder of, a lot of people yeah bring your bring your glock maybe maybe a knife mm. <laughs> numb chucks <laughs> chinese uh, throwing stars eggs were definitely good obviously um it was pretty interesting you know and i don't know if any of the listeners have experienced this in the past but if typically if you get dirty with an egg you're going to catch a lot of hatchery fish. And the second that I threw on a nymph, I started catching wild fish. Oh, really? Which was pretty cool. And I've noticed that in the past in, in different places. So something to think about. Did you get any doubles? No, we lost some big ones, though. We lost some big? big ones. I 700 millimeters plus. Come on, this is a metric system. <laughs> Every time we, we measured a fish, it was in millimeters. The average was probably 490 millimeters, which is... I don't know, anywhere between like five 19, or six feet, 19 and 21 inches. Oh, okay. With the biggest being, I think 25 inches. So nice. It was awesome. I had a good time. Well, speaking of steelhead, what are we talking about today on this episode? That a trout could potentially spawn with a trout and make a steelhead and a steelhead could potentially spawn with a steelhead and make a trout. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's actually pretty complex, but it, we're going to, uh, we got the guys at Fish Bio set in on this one with us and demystified all this. But it, it was, it's a really one of my, fascinating episode. It's, it's one of my, my favorites. My favorite. Really? Jinx. Oh, jeez. Yeah. It's my favorite just because I'm a geek and um, we we got the idea for this episode because we came in here one day and there's this, uh, there's this uh, drawing on the whiteboard that breaks this down, kind of the... Uh, they call it the life history of a uh, of of the fish, and you know they all start out basically as a trout, but then they can express and to either express express you like a, like a cappuccino, yeah. They can either <laughs> they can go espresso steelhead or espresso trout, <laughs> and um, there's a variety of of environmental and uh, yeah. Have you have you guys listened to this? Think about your own fisheries in your head. You know what dams do what what you know what water temperatures do where steelhead 
mainly reside, where trout are mainly concentrated. I mean, think about it in your heads as you guys listen to this, because I think it's um, it really makes a lot of sense. It's fascinating. Yep. And there will be a uh, very detailed illustration that we've been working on for a week and a half, two weeks almost, with fish, the Fish Bio team to kind of give you a visual of what this is that we're going to be talking about. So make sure to hit the show notes. This is one of the most important ones to go look at for show notes to kind of connect the dots with uh, this podcast. So Sounds good, man. Let's take a listen. Let's do it. Hey, welcome to... I'm just kidding. Sorry. (laughs) (laughs) Had to throw a curveball at you. I got you. Okay, so I'm, we're keeping this. We're keeping That's this fine. On. That's fine. Okay, so as Nick was about to say, welcome to another episode of the Barbless Fly Fishing Podcast. I'm your host today, Chad Alderson, with Nick Fish for Hannah. How you doing, Nick? Good, man. Doing well. Good. Well, hey, today we have uh, two guys from Fish Bio on, uh, Matt Peterson and Michael Hellmeyer. Uh, how you doing today, guys? Good. Thanks. Been cool. fishing lately? Oh, not, not as much as we'd, li- as we'd like to. When's the last time you fished? Two weeks ago. No, that's not true. Last weekend. Last day after Thanksgiving. And where'd you where'd you go? Feather River, low flow section. Ooh, how'd, how'd you, you do? do? Two for three. Nice. Damn. Hatchery or wild? Hatchery. That's an important question because the whole discussion we're gonna have tonight today is, is based on whether or not when we catch a fish, if it's a trout or a steelhead, hatchery versus wild. And what makes a uh, a, a trout versus steelhead in the world go it's around? It's actually pretty pretty amazing we've uh we've been recording our fish bio offices now for like three months and about what two weeks ago we came in here and we saw this um illustration on the whiteboard and this illustration um kind of looks like a venn diagram had a baby with um some salmon eggs and some trout but basically what it depicts is um how a trout basically expresses itself and becomes a steelhead or a trout something like that and you let the biologist it's great yeah that's a probably a good segue into letting someone mu- much smarter than me explain what the hell that thing is so michael can you break this down for us a little bit well as we as we talked a little bit leading up to this podcast um and yeah started by you guys when you when you asked about that diagram um Rainbow trout and steelhead are basically the same species. They are the same species, but they're two different life history forms of that species. And over the past 50, 60, 70 years, a lot of research has gone into figuring out or trying to determine what makes the embryo or an individual fish choose or or follow one life history pathway over another does it stay in the river or stay in a lake year round or does it end up going to the ocean and then come back to fresh water to spawn and so just so i'm clear this egg the embryo before it comes out it's going to make a decision somehow that it's going to become a steelhead or a trout and i made that decision before or has that already been determined it has not been determined. That's oh, that's yeah. the that's the yeah, tricky thing. This is the thing that's like that is crazy. the that is the very tricky thing. So yeah. there's a whole slew of factors that figure into ultimately the expression of the life history, but no single factor is a determining factor. So at the egg, since you just touched on the egg, at that stage, there is a a higher chance that whatever hatches out of that egg will become a steelhead if its mother was a steelhead. Hmm. Once that egg hatches and the the sex of of that fish is determined, there's a higher chance it will become a steelhead if that fish is a female. female. Yes. But Hmm. none of those factors, even if the mother was a steelhead and the fish that hatches is a steelhead, Hmm. there's no guarantee that that fish itself will become a steelhead and go to the ocean. Yeah, I'm having these flashbacks right now of, um, I think it was biology class in, in high school where they, they had the brown eyes versus the blue eyes and you could you could figure out what was going to be what. And it's starting to make me nervous. <laughs> but, okay, go on. I'm following so far. Well, it's, it's interesting because of what you said earlier. That's why you can't, if you look at the regulations, everything yeah. in, our, in our waterways say two hatchery trout or two hatchery steelhead if you were going to keep any fish. Because a trout potentially could be a steelhead or anadromous fish that's going which are protected right yes so in the central valley 
um, steelhead enjoy protected status um, and all trout or steelhead that are released from hatcheries they're marked clip they're, they're marked mm-hmm. yep. adipose, adipose clipped clipped. to clipped. identify them yep. from wild fish progeny or from fish that were born in the in the river in the wild those enjoy total protection so there might be resident fish that never go to the ocean on a lot of central valley streams starting i don't know from the from the merced on up to the yuba battle creek to battle and, creek to yeah. deer creek to the to the sacramento right. um up in redding there there is a lot of resident fish there but they might be steelhead or their progeny could become steelhead and then the other thing on the bag limit of z- being zero, there it's zero because if if those fish are in a waterway where they can get to the ocean, they basically qualify for you know they they get a uh, well yeah so they get depart- a pass. There, department it's a zero fishing bag game limit, for a right? long time, and I don't know if they still do considered anything over sixteen inches of steelhead, yeah. which is kind of ridiculous because there's a lot of trout that hang out in our rivers with how much food and everything there is. There's a lot of trout that are bigger than sixteen inches. Yeah, and that's still the case. That regulation it, it is. is still in place. Yeah. And, yep. that, and that's exactly, is that just why? I mean, cause si- but you were saying size doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> no, if a fish is two years old, you know, and it's somewhere in the, whatever, eight to 10 inch range, that fish could still go to the ocean, could, could still yeah. um, follow that, that steelhead life history, or it could Super remain, remain in fresh water. So oh. you don't know. There's no way to tell them apart. Oh, so they can become a steelhead years down the road potentially they could be in freshwater their whole life never never gone out they can the... they can small at a variety of ages anywhere okay. from you know they could be spend one year in freshwater or they could spend up to uh, the oldest small ever recorded i think is about seven and that was out of the columbia river um so they can they can span a wide range of um, ages can you guys um you know there's there's a few listeners i know of that that might not know what smolting is. I barely do. Can you guys kind of break that down a little? Yeah, it's a um, <clears throat> it's a physiological um, transformation that um, salmon and steelhead undergo uh, to prepare themselves to move from freshwater habitats into saltwater habitats. Um, so there's all sorts of um, changes that occur with how they um, uptake. You might is there feel... isotopes involved? Is that what you? It's <laughs> not quite isotopes, but osmoregulate. Uh, yes. So if they're <laughs> If they're in fresh water, their bodies are saltier than the surrounding water, so they continuously take up water. Oh, right. Wow. So freshwater fish pee a lot, about a third of their body weight a day. Whoa. And ocean fish or marine fish, in contrast, pee hardly at all because they lose valuable water because the surrounding water is saltier than their body. Okay. So Is that why they taste better? I'm not sure they do. <laughs> <Are you> <laughs> <laughs> I had a good marinade joke, but I'm just going to skip right over the top of that one. Um, all right. In any so case, inter- the smolting is the yeah the physiological changes a fish needs to change from a freshwater to a saltwater. Okay, and but so they'll they'll pee at one third of their body weight per day. A freshwater, a freshwater fish. Water that's fish. that's the that's the going number. Whoa, I kind of forgot they pee. I want to catch them before they pee. Then obviously. <laughs> <laughs> so after. The fish hatches, the juvenile fish hatches after it's been... It's, what's the gestation period? Is it 50, 50 days? It depends on the water temperature. It depends highly on the water temperature. Somewhere some, somewhere between 40 and 80, depending. It takes longer the colder the water is. Okay. Okay. So once the fish hatches and begins to live in that freshwater environment where, as we said, it might stay for a year, maybe up to seven years before it decides or does not decide actively to to go to the ocean um, it begins to rear and grow and what happens to the fish during that time the the abundance of food the amount of of predators or the sources of mortality whatever could kill that fish or cause that fish to die um, factor in into the equation whether that fish is more likely or not um, to become a steelhead or, or to stick around um, food res- for, uh, food resources, for example, is is supposed to be or is thought to be a, a very important factor. The into more, their survival rate of the fish into the survival rate, and also um, the the growth rate or the 
growth potential that fish can achieve. If there's a lot of food in the fre in fresh water, that fish can grow fast and it can grow really big, which also depends on temperature again. Um, the benefit that a steelhead would get from going to the ocean, which is thought to be the large size, and with large size, especially for a female fish, come a lot of eggs, so high reproductive potential and high fitness. Mm -hmm. If fish can get that in fresh water, if they can grow large in fresh water without going to the ocean, the incentive, if you will, is less to go to the ocean. And that's something you see a, a really popular, a really illustrative example of that would be the rainbow trout populations of you know, southwestern Alaska or Kamchatka, where these rainbow trout 30 inches and 30 plus inches. Yeah. They're a few miles from the ocean, yet they never go to the ocean because all the food resources they need, oftentimes related to salmon runs, they eat salmon mm. eggs, they eat juvenile salmons, lots of fatty food, lots of food that stimulates growth, allows them to grow large enough in those rivers without having to undergo a potentially dangerous migration to the mm. ocean to get that growth and then come back. They can just stay where they are and get just as big. And on the other end, just like our some of our um, coastal streams in California that are almost dry most of the year, all these steelhead will come in, spawn, and then the fry will boogie right back out and go to the ocean because they're, the river's potentially dry and there's not a lot of food. They'll they'll take a couple of years to smolt. Um, usually in the coastal populations, more like two, three years. Um, okay. Uh, the, the average in California, the general kind of average smolt age is about two. I mentioned seven um, earlier. That's from um, an inland um, Columbia River population mm -hmm. that's a long ways away from the um, ocean, and those population that that habitat's very poor. So it took those fish a long time to get up to the age and the size where they could smolt. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they do have to hit certain tar size targets to get out into the ocean to be somewhat successful. That's interesting. And do you know a lot about the steelhead in like Idaho, the A and B class of steelhead that they have there a little bit yeah i, well, I think we, the main the main distinction between the a run and the b run and i'm not 100 percent positive but the a run spends less time in the ocean um so it, once that steel gets out into the ocean it'll only spend one winter i believe out mm -hmm. in the ocean mm -hmm. and it'll grow at a pretty good clip out in the ocean those b run fish um will spend two years two winters out in the ocean and so they can grow a lot bigger and, mm -hmm. then, and then return a little bit later when we floated the middle fork of the salmon uh, some of the guys are talking about those steelhead being you know spawning at some of the highest elevations in the world you know going pretty far and pretty high up in elevation i don't know if that was true or not I bet. But, so yeah. how how long does it take for them to smolt is that like a day or is that weeks or they have to prepare for quite a while um and that i i say decision but it's not really the fish doesn't consciously decide it's going to become a small there's all these conditions you know environmental factors mm -hmm. and physiological um the underlying physiological condition of the fish that kind of dictates whether it's going to stay in fresh water or migrate out to the ocean in a, at a particular time and so if a fish is in really good shape say like um the summer before um the spring it's actually going to go to the ocean that's when it'll start preparing itself um, for that um, eventual smolt migration. Um, the actual transformation um, where they shift over their um, chloride cells, is that right? The chloride cells in their gills and all sorts of the, Michael mentioned the osmoregulation. Um, I think that's a fairly shorter transition, I think. Weeks. Weeks, yeah. Hmm. And is so, it pretty hard on their bodies? Like, do they burn a lot of calories or? They, I'm sure they do burn a lot of calories. They kind of change in general in shape. They become oh, wow. more slender. They change in color. They become more silvery, um, which has to do with, you know, camouflage during, mm -hmm. during migration and out in the ocean. Mm -hmm. Their eyes usually become larger. They become more, even more visually oriented. So I'm assuming... I have not, I don't recall reading anything in particular about the, the caloric demand of smolting, but I would assume it'd be fairly high. So do you, do you guys, is it say, I don't know if this is true or not, but do the, 
let's say the the ones that are in Lake Shasta, do they smolt or do you need do you need fresh do you need salt water in order to, to make that happen? Because I'm catching laker lakers in the lower sack that are have big shoulders, they're super, super bright, you know. What do you guys think? I'm not I'm not sure I I'm not sure on that how they, they must do something like that. You know, they do silver up a little bit in environments like that. So maybe there's something, um, you know, the summer before that kind of kicks that into gear. Mm -hmm. Um, but I haven't, I don't know of much research or anything. I don't think anyone's ever yeah, looked I'm into sure. that in freshwater or landlocked populations of steelhead. Cause that's, that's pretty much, especially in the upper sack that mm -hmm. we, we are assuming that's what they are. There's some steelhead ancestry, some genetics there, yeah. some genetic ancestry yeah, they, they in those steelhead like cause they got in, landlocked, right? Yeah. When they built the dam, there was at least two year classes, one and two year olds of steelhead upstream of that dam when that dam closed. And what those fish did, did they just become lake run, which is a, if you ever heard or read or seen, you know, Great Lakes steelhead, that's all those are. Are they yeah. real steelhead? That's up for discussion. Yeah, we um, had we had Greg Kennedy on um, recently, and, and he, he said that, yeah, that they treat Lake Shasta as like their ocean, you know, and they go up the river. That's what I said. <laughs> you said that the week before, but since Greg said I, it, I know, think like, okay. those fish are awesome though, and I, They're I really believe cool. that they should be used to create more potential wild strain of steelhead within our system, our Central Valley, because I feel like a lot of them below those dams have been lost and affected due to all the damming and you know water um, restrictions. I mean, it, I don't know. Does that make sense at all, or is that it? It makes sense. In so far that there is probably a, a steelhead gene pool upstream of the dams that right. got yeah, locked yeah. locked up there where it might have gotten washed out down below or affected down below. The issue you might have, though, is that even upstream, that steel pool or that, that gene pool of steelhead might have gotten diluted because upstream of barriers, upstream of anadromy, mm -hmm. there's a lot of fish stocking with right. hatchery mm -hmm. rainbow trout. And right. once those interbreed, again, that washes out. Like Dunsmere, them. they're coming down from Dunsmere, and they're, they're like, hey, what's up? Meet you at uh, Pollard <laughs> Flat. It is like Finding Nemo when you think about these yeah. steelhead and rainbows and hatchery fish making their way out to the ocean and the, si you know, and the size they are. What, what Less than 1% will... You know, or very few would make it out to the ocean and even come come back, right? I'd say average <clears throat> average for Central Valley is fairly low. Yeah. You know, probably five to ten percent in a you know, in most years. You know, if you have pretty high water years like two thousand seventeen, you might have a lot better survival. Mm -hmm. Um yep. Okay, so you know, back back to the diagram. Um so we, we were at kind of like the fry stage. And then, so as you know, it sounds like environmental factors will really play a role in how they express, whether they go trout or steelhead. Yeah, the food, I guess steelhead, if really, there's a lot of food and they grow fast, they're more likely to become a rainbow. And that's what the, that, that's what the pie, little pie charts are on yes. each one. And, and we're going to post the, a diagram of this on the show notes, guys. So probably should have that for reference when you uh, are driving, you know. When it says temperature up there, is that temperature of the water? That is temperature of the water. So low temperature um, is trout. High temperature potential steelhead needs to get out of there. And is that correct? Am yes. I reading so that if, right? If the temperature has a as a potential to get really high, basically over the summer month, if it becomes inhospitable, if mm -hmm. it makes the river environment a bad place to be, chances are higher right. that fish may go the steelhead life history route. So the so better cool. conditions are in freshwater, the more likely they'll stay. The worse mm -hmm. conditions are in freshwater, the, the higher benefit they can gain by going to the ocean and coming back. Hmm. But it's a long and it's dangerous It's kind of like trip. a fish version of Grapes of Wrath almost. <laughs> <laughs> well, how else is that? How, so the diagram completes all the way back to basically a fish coming back and spawning at this point, right? Or is my skipping something? No, you're, you're right. The, so what 
has to happen though before that fish can come back and spawn it has to undergo that long and really dangerous journey right, right. and as we know well, especially we don't in the know sack, we right. don't know right <laughs> we don't, a lot of things can happen on during that trip the the fish can get eaten the fish could get sucked into a pump the fish could get washed up and dry up somewhere um and anything from you know seagulls to striped bass to native predators such as pike minnows who knows what might eat that fish and that's just in freshwater and that's just in freshwater exactly and the longer that journey is in general the higher that risk that the fish doesn't make it so that's another another determining not determining but influencing factor that oftentimes the farther or the longer the distance from the ocean the higher the proportion of resident fish or the higher the likelihood that, that fish become resident. That makes resident. sense. Because they don't, you know, the, the journey becomes more and more dangerous the yeah. farther you are from the ocean. Hmm. It, to me, the takeaway there is, especially as, as anglers and people that are getting into fishing, need to be so careful with whatever they catch. You know, whether it's a looks like a, just a little rainbow trout or whatever it is. Those things are so fragile. They have such a long journey to make. I think no matter where you are, especially below a dam, you're just... You see a lot of people mishandling fish, you know, and not taking care of them properly. And and I, I'm, and you know, I've done it before in the past, and I've tried to become a lot better at it. But, you know, wetting your hands, you don't really need a glove, but wetting your hands and making sure if you're going to take a cool Instagram or fish photo, you, you do it quick. You know, keep that fish in the water, pull it out. You know, you almost want every picture to look like the thing's dripping water off of it, so that just people know that you you know you're trying to do your best to keep that thing alive and especially for guides, it's their asset, you know, and it's just so cool. Yep. So, but yeah, in general, you know, if you make it to the ocean, once you made it to the ocean, you have the potential to find a lot of food and grow really large compared to your freshwater siblings or cousins or counterparts. And with fish, especially the, the larger a fish is, the more eggs it has. So, the, the fecundity or the, the amount of offspring it could have is directly related to the size of the individual or the size of the female, if you will. And that's just based on economics, like how, much, how many eggs it's putting out, right? Exactly. Yeah. The, more, the more offspring you can have, the more successful you are yeah. in a biological sense. So that's the trade-off that these fish you know, can go for, these steelhead. The steelhead trade-off is I'm going to the ocean – I'm going to forego the safe freshwater environment. I'm going to go on a long journey, but I'm going to come back bigger and better and stronger and lay a lot more eggs. And not only with larger size, not only do females make more eggs, but the individual eggs are often of higher quality too and have higher survival rates for, for their offspring. But then again, it's a long and dangerous journey. It's a very costly journey from a, from an energetics point of Mm view. Um, you know, they swim hundreds, thousands of miles sometimes, often mm-hmm. without without feeding. They need they need reserves. They, when they finally make it back, they're they're exhausted and emaciated. And they may not be able to do that multiple times. Steelhead can, in contrast to the other Pacific salmon that die after they spawn, steelhead can make that trip multiple times. But it's much less likely for a steelhead to spawn repeatedly compared to a resident fish that just stays in place and when the when the season comes it spawns and then it stays there and when the next season comes it spawns again so that is much less likely for a steelhead so a a a trout let's just say a trout on the upper sack or i'm sorry on the lower sack could let's just say for some weird reason there wasn't any there wasn't much food in the system that year that that trout could go out to the ocean become a small become a steelhead come back lay a bunch of eggs the next season, spawn the next season. All of a sudden when those 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 is it broodstock, am I using the right word? When those those fish come out, um, now all of a sudden there's a lot of food. Every one of those eggs decides to grow up and just stay there. They can all be trout. Is that right? So that is a possible. steelhead mommy can rear nothing but trout. It, it, given I would the, think it's given possible. Those, I haven't seen the nothing, the, given the, that the nothing very weird but scenario. Yeah. Yes. 
That's so. That there's blows no. My mind. There's no absolutes. Right. And it's all. That's what. Yeah. That's but what's that, I mean, that's like. But that's in general. If you, the purest, you know, scenario of what you guys are talking about that could happen, right? Yes. And the and the contrary, right? Yeah, and the contrary. Two fish that have never gone more than a mile from Shasta Dam or Keswick, I guess, um, could have offspring, and all of those go to the ocean. That and would that, be the opposite yeah. extreme, and mm-hmm. that could happen. In theory, how could how does the length of the uh, migration um, affect um, the amount of times that the fish is going to spawn, like a steelhead? So will so a, it really just predation? Will right? a longer yeah. migration give less spawning? You know, spawning years for that fish, or in general, I would I would think so. Yeah. Um, on the Trinity River, where I did some uh, steelhead research. Um, we saw fish spawn up to three times, and it's not a uh, it's not a huge distance from the ocean, right? And that's um, not a very eight more like for steelhead, right? I thought it was more like seven or eight times that they'll do that. Well, how I got to back up a second. How do you guys <laughs> how do you guys know how many times a fish has spawned? <laughs> yeah, so uh, there's a there's a couple different ways I guess you could tell. Um, one is from if you physically handle the fish multiple times, and if it has a tag, right. um, and you recover that tag multiple times, you could you could okay. determine it that way. Um, for my master's um, thesis work, um, I use scales, um, so scales collected from adult fish, and those are pretty. Um, if a fish is spawned, it's pretty the scale it's pattern. A, it's like the it's ring like, of a tree. It's right? like a tree ring Whoa. exactly. Yeah. Um, the, a spawning check is what it's called. It, it's like a ragged, someone ripped a piece of paper Mm -hmm. around the whole edge of the scale. Um, and then uh, there's more ocean growth on top of that. So nice smooth rings. And then, it you know, and then it degrades again. So you can really tell pretty easily when it it met the freshwater. And Uh, yeah, you can tell when it spawned the next year that it, it's, it had to survive and go back out to the ocean. It grew a little bit more and that came back in again and spawned. Hmm. Um, so I, on the Trinity, I think we saw that up to three times maximum. There was like one fish out of 2,500 fish that I examined. Wow. Um, uh, trout, trout on the other hand, I think you're right. I think they can spawn multiple times. I've heard seven, eight times um, in certain locations. Gotcha. I want to say. So, do you get? I want to post a picture of these scales with the rings on them. Do you guys have anything? Yep. You could post. I okay. Do. I, I have a yeah, lot. Yeah, that's pretty cool. <laughs> and then, can you see that with the naked eye and maybe a magnifying glass, or do you need like a uh, like a microscope? Um, well, yeah. Generally, I mean, the scale is only about four to five millimeters um, uh, in diameter. Mm-hmm. Um, but we used a microscope um, outfitted with a digital camera. And so I actually took images of all the scales that I examined for my work. Oh, that's cool. And then, so, yeah, they can be blown up pretty well. And, yeah, they're it's fairly obvious with the naked eye once you enlarge it. Wow. That's very cool. Um, that's pretty cool. You knew that, Nick. What, the rings of the tree? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that brings up a really, really important point, right, as we talked a little bit earlier about what – by the the measure by which biological success is is measured mm-hmm. is how many offspring you can produce mm-hmm. and if you can stay in freshwater and produce just for simplicity's sake a thousand eggs a year and you can spawn five times and if you go to the ocean you might get bigger and spawn three thousand eggs at once but you only do it once right because the trip is so long so dangerous right. um Ultimately, the end the result fish that's are the same. The no, the end result. If one fish does it five times at a thousand eggs, you know, has five thousand eggs. The only the the other fish has three thousand eggs with spawning once. Um, the fish that stays and spawns five times, even though the eggs may be less, the bottom line is that fish has the upper hand biologically. Right. Uh, right? Okay, okay, yeah, because but if, just just season, just environmental factors alone, year to year, could be you know that one that time that one fish spawned that one time it could have been just a really poor year. It could have been a bad year, exactly. You know, the the carrying capacity of the river just wasn't what it was, say the year before. Yeah, but then if steelhead can make that trip multiple times, or say, um, you know, say they make it three times, and all of a sudden they produce nine thousand eggs. 
in three spawning trips compared to the you know 5,000 eggs of the resident fish over five conse- over, over five years, all of a sudden the steelhead life history produces more offspring and so begins to gain or, or has the upper hand biologically, yeah. if you will. It's like placing multiple bets on a craps table. Yes, you know? exactly. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. exactly. <laughs> okay. And that's why in the vast, vast majority of populations where there are steelhead, there are also rainbow trout. And if there are rainbow trout populations that have access to the ocean, the vast, vast majority of them will have a portion of the population that expresses that steelhead life history. Wow, that's pretty cool. That's poetic. <laughs> I love it. They're pretty cool beasts. No, that's that's why we chase them. Well, and then it gets a whole more, a whole lot more complex after that, right? Because within a steelhead life history, and and Matt's the expert on this, but within that steelhead life history, you can have a whole range of of different life history expressions within that. He mentioned earlier they can go out when they're a year old. Most of them go when they're two or three. They can go out to the ocean after seven years. Then they can stay in the ocean for a year or two or three, spawn multiple times, skip a year in between spawning. I think, was it Hodge? Brian Hodge in his paper identified in the Klamath Basin 34 or 37, somewhere mid-30s, different life history pathways of just steelhead. 34 different ways a steelhead can be a steelhead. And that's not even considering the whole rainbow trout thing. (laughs) Holy smoke. So there was a lot of salmon that came back up the uh, feather in Sac Rivers this year that were, they looked like they were only two years old. They were really small. Why why is that? Do you have any idea what that might have caused that? Um, It it may have been just really good survival um, for those fish out in the ocean. And um, um, that's probably... I don't know if they're jacks. Those are probably jacks. Right, but they're even, I mean, they're small. You know, they're, <laughs> they look like trout almost. It was kind of, it was kind huh. of mini jacks. There's, there's, some, there's some evidence that um, uh, actually larger fish, if uh, salmon, we're talking Chinook salmon. Right. Now, um, the larger the fish is when it enters the ocean, actually sometimes the earlier it'll come back. Mm. Um, so if, if you do have a, a cohort of fish that go out, um, that's at a larger size, you tend to expect um, those fish to return earlier um, in general. And steelhead could do the same, technically? Steelhead are more complicated. Do, 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 <laughs> they, <laughs> do, do trout and steelhead, do they segregate by size when you say cohort going out? Are they roughly all the same size, Do you or do you see variation in, in length? The cohort is just the year class. So oh, whatever okay. eggs were laid in 2014, okay. that's the 2014 right. cohort. Okay. And salmon, well, especially, you know, there's some variation when you get into the different salmon species like sockeye salmon. But with Chinook salmon, or especially fall run Chinook salmon, they have a f- relatively narrow out-migration window and a narrow out-migration age. You know, they, the eggs get laid, they hatch... And after they hatch, within a few months, the vast majority of those fish are on their way to the ocean or Mm -hmm. in the ocean. Um, With steelhead, as we mentioned, that process can take multiple years. And also steelhead can migrate to the ocean pretty much at any time of year. There's peaks. Most Mm -hmm. of them head towards the ocean in spring, but they can do it pretty much any time of the year as well. So, yes, yeah, steelhead. In, in certain systems. In certain systems, yeah. yes. So with the uh, the high water, you know, and given given our watersheds, how does that affect, how does that play into this narrative at all, if it does? You know, with the, the, the surge of water, the biomass that's shooting out into the ocean, how does that, does that play any kind of a role? Maybe not for the biomass in the ocean, but generally, like, um, I would expect, you know, the much, much higher water that we had this year. If there Mm -hmm. were steelhead that were out migrating, they'd have a much, much better chance. And so hopefully in a few years we'll see evidence of that. Just based on they have more water to go down. and and There's less less predation. Less contact contact with predators, uh, potentially more food. Um, There's been lots of recent studies. It's like the difference between driving you know, south on a two lane road versus a six lane road, right? Yeah. yeah or, or, right. or running on the treadmill and just, you know, against the treadmill or with the treadmill, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. the fast current transports you or, 
if you're stuck in a <laughs> in an aquarium with a small aquarium with a bass that might eat you or a large aquarium with a bass that might eat you chances right. you'll survive longer or your chances of survival are higher if you're in the large aquarium what happens what happens um, when the steelhead go out to the ocean and or salmon do we even know they essentially disappear I know. What's what's the deal with that? Um, you guys don't put radio beacons on. No, there there are. I'm I'm kind of joking. Um, <laughs> there's a there's a vast um, pool of information on a lot of Chinook uh, salmon species. I mean, um, out in the ocean, they're recovered um, very well in all sorts of uh, commercial fisheries, recreational fisheries, um, and then actual you know sampling out in the ocean, where steelhead are are contacted much 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 less. Um, they essentially disappear. Like no one ever goes fishing in the ocean for steelhead. No, right? nobody really catches them ever. Exactly. Nobody really catches them. And when, when they do pop up, it's often under strange circumstances. I know one guy who caught a steelhead ocean fishing for salmon. He was 20, 20 miles outside of Eureka. He caught it on a tuna plug skipping on the surface. He caught a steelhead. Wow. And I, I know like I have heard of one steelhead that was marked it was a hatchery steelhead from the mad river hatchery that got rec- recovered off of japan so they Whoa. travel far and wide but where exactly and for how long and what they do and why they go where they go that's still very much a big mystery that's incredible i bet they're all under that big garbage pile that's in the middle is it the atlantic or pacific ocean pacific they know no one's going to come by there <laughs> and there's just a big ball of them. They're just chilling. That's crazy. Probably just falling food and currents and all that. But the so the nice. ability for them to go away to Japan and then come back into a river and spawn, that's just pretty much a miracle. Yeah. Well, that one that got caught didn't make it back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, Michael, are, are there any other, um, you know, freshwater or saltwater species that do something similar to, to that, like, like a, like a trout or a steelhead does? There's quite a few species that do have a, a similar life history and so far that they undertake really, really long migration. They grow in, in a completely different place than where they actually lay their eggs and spawn. Um, a really good example and kind of mind-boggling example is, is eels and different species of eels. But different from lampreys, different from lampreys, not lampreys. We do not have eels on the West Coast, but there are eels on the East Coast and there's eels in Europe. And I've worked a little bit over the past couple of years with with European eels, actually. And what they do is they kind of do the opposite of um, of what steelhead do. They grow to maturity, grow to adulthood in freshwater, but then spawn in the ocean. And not just anywhere in the ocean, but there's this fairly defined, I think by now, modern science after years and years has it narrowed down to a few hundred square miles of where it is. It's somewhere halfway between Bermuda and and the Caribbean in the Sargasso Sea. That's where the adults actually lay their eggs, somewhere 3,000 feet below the surface in the Atlantic Ocean. And then their juveniles drift with the Gulf Stream, takes them about two to three years to the European coasts, and there the eels glass eels at that point you might have heard of that glass eel soup is kind of a delicacy in the <laughs> in the far east but glass <laughs> eels start to migrate up the rivers to lakes suitable freshwater habitats and stay there and grow for anywhere f- between five and 20 years wow. and then again once they get to a big enough size i was mentioning the the lake constance example earlier you know smack in the middle of europe once they get to a certain size usually starts in the fall they migrate downstream out of the lake all the way down the Rhine River into the North Sea, around England, and somewhere, somewhere between the Caribbean Whoa. and and Bermuda. And do they yeah. smolt like like steelhead do? They do. They do. They have a and physical transformation. Ph- and physio- very yeah. very similar to what steelhead. Their eyes get bigger. Whoa. Their bellies go from yellowish to silvery. Hmm. Um, so they they have that same counter shading, very light silvery below, dark on it, top. It makes you wonder if there's any you know ancestral history there. That maybe they're from the same, I don't know. Between eels and steelhead, that's a long shot. I go out on a limb and say that there certainly is between brown trout and steelhead, which oh. brown trout are very, very similar to steelhead when it comes to life history. And well, anadri- I love anadromy. I love anadromy. Trout, so. And anadromy. So in Europe, they have sea trout, which are anadromous brown trout that do the same thing that, that steelhead do here. 
In Argentina, right? I mean, is that in Argentina? Right. In Argentina, they have they have mm. Sierra Browns. There are some rumors there's Sierra Browns somewhere on the west coast. I have yet to see one. They talk that about I that on the Trinity. On the Trinity, yes. Yeah, no, yes. We've heard a lot about that. I've I've seen fish that cut that have a really blue kind of iridescence to them, yeah. and then and then the local or what we think of native Browns are a lot yellower. And that's, yeah. you know, maybe a silvery, more silvery brown. I don't know if that's maybe. true or not, but. I mean, I've I've caught, and you were with me, what was that, a year ago? I've caught brown trout on the Pitt River where they were definitely not sea run. But, but they had They that, could have passed for a sea run brown trout right. based on their coloration. So that's not, right. I wouldn't, I wouldn't Can't label bet like on that, that yeah. based on coloration. Hmm. Hmm. That's pretty cool. So that those eels are fished for, they're harvested in that lake, and yeah, eels are harvested are they, in that lake. It's they a, taste a better popular... when they're smaller, or when they get. I think most fish do taste better when they're smaller. Right. Um, you know, the typical size of one of those would be somewhere between thirty and forty inches. Yeah. <laughs> um, once they get bigger, they're kind of you know fire hose, just oh about fire God. hose diameter, very very fatty, very greasy. Do they use um, the water that just like the steelhead do? The springtime, the you know, flows are high. They'll try to come up in. Same, the, same situation, I'm, or I'm not sure when the eels migrate upstream. I think it's a uh-huh. year. On. It's not that easy for them to time. You know, how long does it take till you arrive on the coast from, you know, via the Gulf Stream from the Caribbean? It's like somewhere in a two to four year window. So you can't, oh, we'll make it there in spring. Um, It's not not as pronounced, not as seasonally specific. Mm -hmm. But the adults typically start to out migrate um, during the fall, which is typically when you get the big rains there and the higher flows. Let's compare that to um, the lampreys that we have here. Lampreys are, again... The other way around. So they're not, um, lampreys are like steelhead and salmon in that they're anadromous. So mm-hmm. and they eels don't... are catadromous. So if they spawn in salt water and grow to maturity in fresh water, they're catadromous. The other way around, like salmon and steelhead do, they're anadromous. And lampreys huh. are anadromous. One of the oldest species to that has been coming and using our fresh waters. Right? Yes. For, yes. Jawless fish. They don't actually don't even have a jaw yet. They that had not even developed in lampreys, and they're. Yeah. Met. I guess you could classify them as predatory. They're either they're either parasitic, 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 or there's lamprey stages that the adult stage all they do is reproduce. So they're the parasitic actual, and jawless. It sounds like a politician. <laughs> <laughs> Tell, Matt, tell us about their um, spawning habitat or like their, how they spawn in, in our local waters. You were mentioning something about a. I thought they're uh, broadcast spawners or free spawners, but you said they actually create beds. Yeah, they, they essentially in. create uh, nests similar to salmon and steelhead. Um, but what's really unique about lamprey um, spawning behavior is that they'll actually um, they'll make a kind of a pot shaped um, depression. Um, but how they remove the rocks um, is with their with their suckers, mm-hmm. and and they'll actually grab the rocks with their mouth and move the rocks, and so they'll move the rocks into a, like a ring shaped um, uh, like, ring around like campfire, the, almost. essentially, yeah, wow. exactly. And there's like a just a bowl shaped depression with a ring of rocks around it, wow. um, and I've seen seen that on the Little River in in Humboldt County. Uh, how, how big of a types. diameter are we talking? Oh, about eight inches, six to eight inches, hmm. wow. probably. Yeah, about your hand. your hand. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty neat. Huh. So they're in sturgeon. They're, um, do you think they're older than the lampreys or do you think the lampreys are? I know individual sturgeon can get older than individual lampreys. Right. But as I a, think as a species, unlike a, no individual, an individual, oh, individual sturgeon individual, can yeah. get older than a, than an individual lamprey. Right. I think on the, on the tree of life, if you will, I think lampreys came before sturgeon. Wow. Right. Right. They're nasty looking. So they're things. pre prehistoric. They look like little aliens that landed some some point. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see that picture of the one on, on the Feather River Hatchery? No. With the tooth? Oh. Yeah. No, I saw these fish on the Delta, these bait fish these guys are using to catch striper. And it's they got a sucker on their stomach. I don't know what they're called. I forget what they're called. I was telling you about that the other day. It might have been on another sh- episode. Yeah. But um they that they're gross. Wait, what? Bait fish to catch stripers that have a sucker on their stomach? catch in the, in the surf, 
and they've got a sucker on the bottom of their mud suckers is what they call them. Have you heard that? Oh, heard long jaw, long jaw mud suckers. Yes. I saw one in the flesh, man. The thing's the creepiest thing I've ever seen in my life. Huh. I didn't know they use those for bait. Yeah, they catch striper on them in the delta. Huh. You tie some mud sucker flies. Pretty, pretty simple rig, and it's like almost a drop shot with a eight up, two feet up off the bottom. They hook the another hook in and put it under the jaw, and the bait fish is kind of like waddles off the top of the ball two feet off the bottom and they just hammer st- striper that way apparently do you With, think um, do you think these trout and steelheads um populations go in um waves as far as you know highs and lows and populations and it's gonna bounce back because obviously it's at i think an all-time low in, in our central valley do you do you see it bouncing back there's definitely you know natural fluctuations in population levels right. um as far as the Central Valley, definitely hope, you know, steelhead populations are recovering. Um, they're definitely low right now. And, and I think one of the factors um, that, we're, that we're trying to get at with this diagram is that um, it's, uh, there's a lot of reasons why there might be more rainbow trout in the Central Valley now than there are steelhead. Um, and it's a lot of the environmental conditions and a lot of the degradation that has occurred in the central valley Mm -hmm. um so we've shifted um you know with the for your listeners you know we've we've identified um all sorts of different factors where if you shift uh water temperatures let's say if you uh shift food production a certain way you're going to tend to get more rainbow trout than steelhead um and a lot of streams in the central valley are a classic case where we've shifted things way in one direction and i think that's one of the main reasons why we have a bunch of rainbow trout below all our tailwater dams, but not a lot of steelhead. When did the Shasta Dam go in? 1945. I so, want to say. can you um, describe like the current conditions in in the lower sac that that are making well, it, more? It makes a lot of sense because when they put that dam in, so much cold water started coming out. Yeah, I, really? I just I just want and to understand like the state of the union today on the lower sack. Right. And then if we wanted a bunch of steelhead to come in or, or Raise set, the temperatures. It up, set it up to where they might want to stick around and, and start coming in in bigger numbers, what would you do? There was, right. there was a lot of steelhead in the seventies, you know, and, and I think it just started getting colder and colder and colder coming out of the dam. I mean, did that have an impact on it? It's, that, it certainly might have, yeah. um, you know, and it's a, it's a, culmination of factors right the the water temperature and the discharge goes along with the food production right. all of a sudden right. and the sacramento and, and other central valley streams are a good example of that where all of a sudden in places where before you might have had a section of river that got really really warm during summer you might have had a section right. that dried up during summer all of a sudden you have year-round cold flows so it became much more um, much more hospitable to, to stay there and not go to the ocean. Um, the invertebrate production to food production is most likely higher on a year-round basis because those mm-hmm. conditions are good on a year-round basis. So you've kind of turned the dial towards the, the resident life history based on those conditions. At the same time, the migration to the ocean and back has become more dangerous due to predation death, death and of a thousand cuts. Uh, yeah exactly um and the i think really promising the really cool thing about steelhead or rainbow trout is that they seem to retain that flexibility to to shift the life history or or produce more of one life history over another as conditions change so there are some some incidences where rainbow trout population have been isolated while they were steelhead then they became isolated by a dam Mm -hmm. and once they were given a chance that steelhead life history showed back up again so what if those fish were transplanted below a dam some of those went to the ocean so they can still do that even though they haven't done it for generations and generations um another example from the the kamchatka peninsula where the steelhead life history was severely depressed due to commercial fishing. They fished in the estuary and just pretty much caught every steelhead. So there were hardly any steelhead left. And then they banned commercial fishing. And within a couple generations, the steelhead the steelhead runs bounced back. <clears throat> so there's, I don't know to, to what extent you want to get into, you know, artificially trying to twist those dials to force one life history yeah. over another. And it right. may have side effects and you may have to decide 
what it is that you really want in your population. Do you want an overall large number? You know, do you want 10,000? Would you rather have 10,000 rainbow trout or would you rather have 1,000 rainbow trout and 1,000 steelhead? So th there's going to be trade-offs involved if you try to, to manage actively over one life history over another. Um, but yeah, I think the, the good thing about it, the, the really neat thing about steelhead the um, adaptation rainbow is that, that the potential remains there right. to, to go either way. Once they, once they become a steelhead, they, they can't go back, right? Or is it more of a definition? Or are they, is a steelhead more defined by where it chooses to, what it chooses to do rather than what it looks like? Where you have been, I guess. If yeah. you have been to the ocean, you're a steelhead. You're for a life. steelhead. A yeah. rainbow trout that has made it to the ocean is officially a steelhead. It's like they get a tattoo. They've graduated. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> This is all super good information. Thank you guys for coming in yeah, and, and talking with much. us. Yeah, about good this. to be awesome. here. Um, yep, I, I, I learned a lot. I, I just it's a really neat just view of this diagram. I think it should be out everywhere so people can see it and kind of understand it. It will be soon. Good. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks again, guys, for coming on. Thanks for taking the time. Thanks Thank for you. having us. Right. This podcast would not be possible without support from our sponsors, Fish Bio and Amped Up Build. Fish Bio is a consulting firm that offers a fresh approach to fishery science. They specialize in fish research, monitoring, and conservation with innovative uses of technology and communication. From their offices in Chico, Oakdale, and Santa Cruz, California, to Vienchen, Laos, Fish Bio is committed to solving natural resource challenges locally and globally. Learn more at www.fishbio.com. And Amp.Bill. Amp is a software design and engineering shop located in Chico, California. Amp creates beautiful apps for mobile and desktop devices, wearables, and the Internet of Things. Amp develops native, web, and hybrid apps on a variety of platforms. Chad, who co-hosts this podcast, is the agency's founder. Learn more at www.amp.build.